Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, congratulations. It's almost the end of uh, uh, the conference. I know these things can be pretty draining, so thanks for hanging in there. Uh, my name is Brian Barkley. I work at LinkedIn, and I'm going to be talking about a project that we've been working on for a little while called Hodor. So like the fictional character sharing the same name, Hodor is meant to be helpful and protective and does its best to keep our microservices from becoming overloaded uh, and falling over. We've been running Hodor in production for over a year at this point. Uh, it's been deployed to close to 1,000 of our microservices. These are individual services, not machines. Uh, and we've seen hundreds of instances where it has engaged uh, to help protect the service from going down, becoming overloaded, and potentially becoming unresponsive. Uh, I'll, I'll note at the beginning here that uh, Hodor has been developed for our Java-based services, so aspects of its implementation and this talk are going to be somewhat Java-focused, but a lot of the ideas could be adopted uh, to use uh, on other runtimes as well. So where did we come up with this name? Uh, Hodor stands for Holistic Overload Detection and Overload Remediation. So the uh, detection and remediation points are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the holistic part needs a bit of explanation, though. So we want to be able to catch a wide variety of different overload scenarios uh, across a wide variety of different service types. Uh, so at LinkedIn, we have some services that are very lightweight uh, with response times in sub-millisecond to single-millisecond times, uh, and they're very focused. Uh, but we have others that respond in like hundreds of milliseconds and do massive fan-outs and a lot of data aggregation. And so Hodor needs to be able to run on all of these, and we want to be able to do that with zero configuration or tuning that's specific to the service so that service owners don't need to worry about uh, setting it up, and it just works out of the box. So first, let's start off by defining what an overload is. Uh, I use a definition that's pretty simple. Uh, it's a process that is being asked to do more work than it's capable of doing using the resources that are available to it. So we've all probably felt overloaded at some point in our lives with too much to do, and distributed microservices aren't that different. They can similarly break down uh, if the amount of traffic that's uh, sent to them increases drastically and they become overwhelmed. They don't have the resources to be able to handle it. So the resources that we're talking about here can be divided up into two groups. There are physical resources and virtual resources. So physical resources are, are pretty clear. Uh, they're based around physical limits, they are usually hardware-based, and they can't be changed uh, without hardware modifications. Uh, for example, a machine has a limited number of CPUs to use. Uh, once they're all in use, you either have to time slice additional work across them, or you have to queue things up to run later. You can't just like edit some property file, and instantly you've got more CPUs to use. Uh, I mean, with like VMs and control groups, there is that, but there's still going to be some physical upper bound that you're going to hit at some point. Similarly, uh, you've got a finite amount of memory to use, uh, especially in Java, where the heap is bounded and set at, at application start, and if you exceed that, you're going to get an out-of-memory error, and your process is going to be brought down. Uh, disk I.O., network bandwidth, these are also physical limits that can impact the performance of a system once they've become fully saturated. So virtual resources are entirely different in that they're usually just thresholds that can be modified through code or through configuration, but they can actually have the same sort of impact as physical limitations. So some examples include thread pools, which bound the uh, amount of concurrency that can uh, be run at one time. Connection pools, which uh, protect usually a database. Uh, file descriptors, which prevent runaway processes from impacting the OS or other uh, applications running on the same machine. And semaphores, which may be guarding resources that are uh, limited and need protection. So the limits for virtual resources are usually in place to prevent overuse of something else. but once uh, those limits are hit, they can actually end up causing an overload for the larger system that is using them. 
So I'm going to go through uh, a couple of exam examples of overload scenarios that, that we've seen pretty commonly at LinkedIn with our microservices. Uh, first, and sort of most obviously, uh, an increase in traffic can uh, push a service into overload. So here, we've got a service operating in a steady state. Uh, it is doing a certain amount of work. It's got a, uh, you know, a fixed number of requests coming in. Uh, the resources that it is using are represented by the gears, and it's able to handle the current traffic levels just fine. But if the traffic increases drastically, the process uh, is going to run out of memory and or CPU, and it's going to enter an overload state where it may crash or just slow down to the point where it's basically useless. Another example we've repeatedly seen in our systems is where increased back pressure from a downstream uh, service causes an overload. So in this example, we have two services, A, which is calling B, and for a variety of reasons, B could uh, be returning responses slower than normal. So this puts additional pressure on the upstream service uh, as it has to uh, handle more sort of partial uh, in-flight requests, or rather responses from B, uh, and it's also holding more of its own requests in place. So the amount of traffic that A has received uh, it hasn't changed here, but it's using more resources to be able to handle that. And uh, this can quite easily result in the service becoming overloaded. This situation in particular um, highlights the importance of mitigating overloads because uh, they can negatively affect upstream clients, leading to a cascading failure uh, up the entire call tree. So ideally, people would be developing their clients or their services uh, to have tight timeouts uh, or circuit breakers to protect against these problems. But in reality, uh, it's easy for developers to forget to add them or configure them correctly until it's too late. And without them, uh, up, uh, overloads can easily move their way up the call tree uh, and affect an entire system. So finally, here's an example of what we call a noisy neighbor. Uh, in this situation, you've got multiple services running on the same host, um, but they're running with either no isolation, poor isolation, or maybe like you've got C groups configured to allow bursting. So they, they are able to impact each other to some degree. In a steady state, all the services are operating fine. But uh, one of them might start taking on more work than normal, which is not enough to overload itself. Um, here, C has, has taken on a bit more work than normal. Um, but it's enough to start impacting other processes that are running on the same box. And if one of those is already close to the tipping point, it's, it can often be enough to push itself into overload. So. Once uh, we're in an overload situation, how do we recover from it? At the end of the day, we need to reduce the load on the application. And there are a couple ways to do this. Uh, one option is to operate in a degraded mode. Uh, so for example, if you have a search service that normally returns 50 results during an overload situation, you could uh, limit that to just 10. And so that's going to reduce the amount of processing power uh, required and memory required for each request. The problem with this is that it almost always involves custom code for each service to intelligently uh, change its behavior. And so uh, we don't currently have support for this with Hodor, but wouldn't roll it out in the future. Uh, but to start with, we took another approach, which is to reduce the traffic. So, Handling fewer requests should clearly uh, lead to less load on the service. So here's a super high-level view of what Hodor is made of. There are three main components. First, we have the overload detectors, which are monitoring the system. So these run independently. There's multiple of them. They monitor different things. Uh, and they're queried for each inbound request. And we take the highest level signal from all of them and use that uh, to decide whether the service is overloaded or not. Second, we've got what we call a load shedding strategy. And this is used to determine uh, whether individual requests are going to be handled or rejected. Uh, 
And finally, there's a platform-specific adapter. Uh, so this ties the two together. Uh, it takes the signal from the overload detectors, hands it over to the load shedding strategy, gets a result saying whether this should be dropped or not. Um, and this adapts any framework-specific request and response APIs and data to use with Hodor. So we currently have adapters for gRPC, uh, our LinkedIn's open source uh, REST-based framework called RESTly, as well as the Play framework. Uh, those are our, our three main frameworks that we use. And this platform-specific component also determines how the rejection is going to happen. Um, basically what the return type is. So for gRPC, that's an unavailable status. For HTTP responses, it's gonna be a 503 service unavailable. So I'm gonna get into a little more detail here about how the individual overload detectors that we have work. So we currently have three detectors that we're using in production. Uh, the first two are for physical resources, CPU and memory. Uh, and the third is for a virtual resource, which is the application thread pool for our Jetty services. So one thing to note that's, that's common between all three and, and how we went about developing these is that the uh, design principle or the development principle behind them is that they should be uh, focused on precision. And in that sense, they are somewhat uh, conservative. Um, so the consequence of an overload or for one of these things firing is that requests are dropped and that's gonna have an impact on either users or like batch applications or something. It's, it's, it's a non-consequential result. So we'd rather be more conservative and fire late, which is the state of the system if Hodor wasn't in place at all, right? You'd still be getting to that point. Hodor is just stopping things a little early. So first up here is our CPU detector. We refer to this as the heartbeat detector uh, because it monitors the health of a heartbeat signal. At its core, what this is doing is monitoring thread scheduling delays within the JVM. Uh, the basic implementation is we have a background thread that sleeps for a brief time, say 10 milliseconds. And then when it wakes up, we compare the time that it actually slept to the expected time. And if the system isn't under load, the actual time should be what uh, the expected time is. But if we see consistent violations uh, of a threshold over multiple windows, it indicates that there are delays in thread scheduling and that there's CPU starvation and overload. So this would apply to all threads within the application. So here, uh, is like an example of some of the thresholds that we have set up. So if we see like uh, the thread sleeping for more than 13 milliseconds instead of 10, uh, for 28 out of 30 windows, we flag it as being overloaded. And the, the thresholds that we have uh, are the result of a, a lot of uh, testing using both synthetic applications that were designed to stress certain parts of the system uh, and pushed hard under load, as well as data collected from our production systems during live load tests. So the thread in use here uh, runs inside the Java virtual machine with the same priority as application threads. So it's actually affected by JVM activity, such as garbage collection. And this is a feature, not a bug, because it allows us to catch some types of memory-related overloads as well. When the, the garbage collector, collector really engages, it stresses out the CPU. And we chose this method rather than monitoring uh, CP, just raw CPU time uh, because it works independent of where the service is running. So it works on bare metal, in a virtual machine, or within C groups. So here are some examples, uh, or an example with some metrics from, from one of our systems. Uh, this graph in the upper left represents when the heartbeat detector is firing. And as you can see, it correlates really well with elevated 90th percentile latency and average latency increases, which, you know, especially here in the 90th percentile is really big. Uh, it also correlates well with uh, higher CPU usage. So it's, it's pretty clear that the, the service here is under stress and needs some relief. Next up is the garbage collection detector. Since Java uses a garbage collector for its memory management, uh, 
the behavior of the GC algorithm in use, as well as the configuration settings for it, can really impact how well a service performs, especially as memory begins to run out and become more fragmented. So we want to determine when the GC activity is going to start negatively affecting application behavior and potentially leading to um, a, a GC death spiral, in which case the application would basically die off. So to do this, we listen to GC events that the JVM publishes, uh, with each event indicating how much time was spent collecting garbage. We then amortize these over a window to determine what percentage of time we spent in GC. So similar to the heartbeat detector, we've come up with different thresholds uh, through both synthetic and live testing uh, that we found to be good indicators of the, the JVM becoming overloaded and the service starting to be negatively impacted. Uh, we have different thresholds for what we call different tiers of GC activity, which we've noticed uh, or have seen to lead to overload. So for example, if more than 11% of time is being spent in GC for more than 10 consecutive seconds, that uh, is bad and uh, we signal an overload. Uh, we also have um, thresholds with lower percentages but longer time spans. For example, 9% of time in GC for more than 20 seconds. And here are some metrics collected during a GC overload event. Uh, as you can see, the GC um, detector is firing up in the upper left here. And this correlates really well with a pretty drastic increase in 99th percentile and 90th percentile latencies. Um, this, you know, GC can, can really negatively affect applications. Uh, in this case, it was, it looks like it was caused by a, a large increase in traffic that the service just wasn't able to handle. So we'd like to be able to mitigate this before the service falls down. So finally, there is a detector which monitors the application thread pool uh, used by a lot of our services. Um, they operate in non-asynchronous mode uh, using Jetty as the underlying server. And in this mode, Jetty allocates a thread per request, which is retrieved from a fixed size thread pool. Once the available threads run out, uh, Jetty begins queuing requests until a thread from the pool is available to handle them. So our detector monitors the waiting time in this queue and will signal overload if the waiting time consistently violates thresholds that, that we've set up. For example, uh, if we see that requests are taking more than 50 milliseconds, or waiting in the queue for more than 50 milliseconds for more than 10 consecutive uh, second long windows, we'll flag the service as overloaded. And since this detector is uh, based on a thread pool, which is a virtual resource, uh, it's a little more straightforward to reason about than, than like the uh, GC and the CPU-based detectors. It doesn't involve as much like divination and reading of tea leaves to come up with like what are the magic parameters that work well for all of your services. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. The request is sitting and waiting in a queue and isn't even being touched by your service. Um, and, and so we just need to decide what the bound is that we're comfortable with before providing relief. And again, we don't want to do this too early because uh, it might end up shedding load unnecessarily or in a situation where the service might be able to recover on its own. So these are some metrics from a thread pool over uh, overload event. Um, again, in the upper left here, we've got uh, when the detector is firing. Uh, this graph is the, the, the wait time in the thread pool. I don't know if you can see, but th this is pretty terrible. This is, uh, things are waiting there for 15 seconds, uh, just sitting. And as you can see, there are extremely high uh, 99th and average latency increases as well. So service is in a really bad state here. All right, so now that we've covered how we detect when a service is overloaded, I'm gonna dive into some of the load shedding strategies that we've created to recover uh, from the situation. So initially we started with something simple, which is a technique using an adaptive percentage. Uh, the concept is pretty straightforward. We start by dropping a fixed percent of traffic, say 10%, 
and then monitor the overload detectors to see if that got us out of overload or not. Uh, if we exit overload quickly, we may uh, be dropping too much. 10% might be too much to drop. So we will reduce the amount to drop until we find an equilibrium point where we are not entering overload, but we um, are just on the cusp there. On the other hand, if the initial percentage isn't enough to provide relief, which it's often not, we will incrementally increase the percentage to drop until the overload's gone. Once an equilibrium point is found, we'll periodically probe by allowing more traffic back into the system to see if the cause of the overload is gone. Um, and then we'll gradually ramp up until we're uh, accepting all traffic back to 100%. So this approach to load shedding worked well in our early tests, um, but we found that once it was used in environments where the traffic patterns vary a lot, um, we ran into to some problems there. For example, if uh, after the initial overload traffic spiked even further, we would re-enter overload and a new equilibrium percentage needed to be calculated. But on the other hand, uh, if the situation uh, resolved itself and traffic died down, we'd still be dropping that same percentage of traffic. And so we'd be dropping some that's, that's unnecessary. So, to uh, address these issues, we move to a model that works by limiting the number of concurrent requests that are handled by a service. So this works similar in concept to the percentage-based strategy where the concurrent count is monitored and increased or decreased and we find an equilibrium point uh, for it. Um, and, and, and try to find the, uh, the number of, or the concurrency that can be allowed at that time. And I say at that time because this value can change quite a bit depending on what the nature of the overload is. Uh, for example, if you are all of a sudden getting 2x the traffic that you were before, uh, the, the cause of the overload and the resources that are running out within your application could be much different from an overload that's uh, caused by back pressure from a downstream. So this is why we determine the limit dynamically instead of using a stored value from previous overloads. Each situation uh, is often a little different. So using concurrency, fix the problem that we saw uh, when using a percentage. Uh, you know, we've got this, this concurrent number that we're allowing through. If the traffic increased, we just sort of uh, are shedding all the additional stuff. Similarly, if it decreases, uh, we're allowing more back in. So we don't need to uh, adjust this number like we did with the percentage-based approach. We did run into uh, one issue, though. Uh, why is this not? There we go. Uh, one issue with the concurrency-based strategy, which is that it didn't work well once we introduced traffic prioritization uh, to the system. And I'll get more into that in a couple of slides. Sorry, my slides are not advancing. All right, so what happens to the requests that are dropped? Uh, ideally, service clients should be impacted as little as possible, so retrying the request on another service or another instance of the service should be an option. Retries uh, are safe to do because requests are rejected before any application logic has been executed, but we don't want them to retry things if the whole cluster is overloaded because that can make the problem worse and lead to a retry storm. So to prevent this, uh, we maintain multiple retry budgets, both on the server side and the client side. On the server side, we have histograms that track how many times incoming requests from clients have already been retried. And we use this to determine if the whole cluster uh, is in bad shape. And if it is, uh, we tell clients do not retry this request when we are rejecting them. Uh, on, on the client side, we also have a couple uh, different budgets, a per uh, request retry budget as well as sort of a uh, global per service budget. And uh, if any of these are exceeded, the clients will stop sending retries temporarily. So fortunately, so far at least, we haven't seen retry storms uh, with this in place. So finally, I'll talk about some of the projects that we've worked on that are closely tied to Hodor uh, and some plans that we have for the future. So first, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we added support for traffic prioritization, uh, which we refer to as traffic tiering. Uh, 
So the idea behind traffic tiering is pretty simple. Uh, it is that not all requests have the same priority, and we need to decide uh, when to drop some that may be more important than others. So at LinkedIn, we have three traffic tiers currently. The lowest priority is optional traffic. So this can be dropped with no impact to a user. Examples of optional traffic are things coming from our offline or nearline systems where there's not a warm body uh, sitting behind it waiting for a response. So these can easily be retried uh, with no impact to a user. Another example is our mobile and web clients will often prefetch data. Um, an example is like if you uh, you know, if you've loaded our, our app and you're looking at our activity feed, it'll prefetch the next couple of entries there so that when you scroll, they're already ready. So these can be dropped with, with no impact to the user, um, and they can be re-executed later with a higher priority uh, when the user actually makes that uh, event uh, instead of prefetching. So the next tier of traffic that we have is what we call degradable. So Dropping this means that there's going to be some impact to uh, the, that the user will see, but, and it will lead to a somewhat degraded experience, but not broken. And then finally, our highest level of traffic we call non-degradable. This is stuff where if it's dropped, you're probably going to end up with a, a broken page. So with traffic tiering in place, we drop the lowest priority traffic first. Um, and then if that's not providing enough relief to a service, we sort of move up uh, the tiers to drop degradable and then non-degradable if needed. So as I mentioned before, uh, we found that the concurrency-based load shedder worked well until we introduced traffic tiering. And the problem that we bumped into was that the histograms that we used to track the data for the different tiers uh, weren't working with concurrency as the metric. And this is because if we're rejecting these requests, they are not concurrent requests. They're not being served. So we moved this to uh, use rate-based tracking as the metric. Um, sorry, there. Right. Uh, rate-based tracking as the metric with an adaptive um, shedding strategy similar to the percentage and concurrency ones, but under the hood using throughput as the metric. We still actually use concurrency as sort of the, the source of truth, uh, and we have a feedback loop between the concurrency uh, tracker as well as the throughput-based tracking so that its accuracy um, is increased. So I want to touch briefly on how we rolled this out at a massive scale. As I mentioned before, Hodor is running on close to 1,000 individual services now, uh, which are deployed on hundreds of thousands of servers. We need to onboard to these services safely to ensure that the, detect the detectors were working well with them and that they weren't causing false positives, leading to unnecessarily dropped traffic. So to do this, we would enable Hodor on batches of services in monitoring mode where the detectors are active and firing but the load shedding is disabled. So initially, only our heartbeat detector was developed and ready to use. So we monitored these services for at least a week uh, through production load tests to collect data on when the detectors were firing and whether there were corresponding changes in other uh, metrics such as latency, CPU usage, and GC activity, looking closely for false positives. Uh, after we were confident that the detector was working correctly for the service, we'd enable load shedding and continue to monitor it for false positives. And we used the same process to roll out the uh, GC detector as well as the thread pool detector once they were available and ready for use in prod. So based on the previous slide, uh, we should have ended up with a system where there are a few to no false positives, right? Well, Murphy's Law is alive and well, um, and guess what? We've got false positives. So these, these pop up for a number of reasons. Uh, as service code changes, its behavior and the memory usage patterns change. Uh, we've also seen behavioral changes due to resizing of service fleets. So one, income, uh, one outcome of Hodor 
is that as a company, we feel more comfortable reducing fleet sizes so that services aren't as over-provisioned as they were before. Uh, some services that were greatly over-provisioned with more hosts than they needed have been downsized to run on fewer machines, which pushes, pushes the services uh, harder and closer to where their overload tipping point may be than when they were when we did the initial onboarding evaluation. So one of the most, problem, uh, most common problems that we've seen is that the garbage collector uh, may not be tuned very well for services and will want, run frequently doing uh, consistent micro pauses, which don't end up affecting latency for applications very much, but they are long enough and consistent enough to trigger our heartbeat detector. Uh, this actually surfaces underlying issues with services. It's, it's an indication that their GC is not tuned well and that they're not operating efficiently. So it's, you know, there's a bit of a trade-off there, a little, little bad with a, a false positive load shedding, but a little good in surfacing a problem. Uh, and these usually can be tuned so that they um, can operate more efficiently and uh, increase their usable capacity. So our solution to deal with this problem is to correlate detector firings with uh, monitoring of increase in latency, and only then will shed load. And the algorithm that we use for this is based on a moving average crossover. So we have two sliding windows of, of different sizes uh, with a multiplier between the two of them that was derived through experimentation, which um, lets us know when the latency is increased by a uh, substantial amount. So I also want to talk briefly about how we do data analysis for the whole system. Uh, to see how it's performing and how we can improve it. One of the initial questions that we had was, how can we evaluate new detector models or test new threshold values? Uh, it's easy enough to do with our synthetic test beds that we built, but that doesn't compare to the wide range of application behavior that we see in production systems. So we still need to validate that things will work in the real world before just deploying something without thorough testing. So what we did, uh, we ended up creating a data pipeline for the relevant metrics that we're interested in, including raw heartbeat data and garbage collection events. And we pushed this through Kafka for later offline analysis. And this has allowed us to collect data for training new detector models using uh, true positive examples that we co collect from production, as well as just gathering general data to use when evaluating changes to either threshold values or trying out new detectors. So finally, here are some things that are on our roadmap related to Hodor. First, more detectors. We, we don't catch 100% of overloads, uh, and adding additional types of detectors can fill some of the gaps that are not covered by the more general purpose CPU and GC detectors. Uh, on our radar is adding coverage for monitoring Netty's event loop, which is analogous to the Jetty thread pool for Netty services. Uh, LinkedIn also has an open source asynchronous execution engine called Parsec, which a large number of our services use. Uh, and monitoring its execution can give us a, a higher fidelity signal about what the um, delay is in processing than monitoring just the CPU alone. So you might remember that I mentioned disk I.O. and network activity uh, or network bandwidth earlier as, as physical limits. But honestly, we rarely see these limits leading to overload in our applications. So we don't have any current plans for building detectors for them. Uh, I should also mention that the framework is pluggable. So uh, app, uh, service owners can um, create their own overload detectors if they have an important resource that they, that they know is critical and that they want to monitor uh, and have Holder keep an eye on it. Next, our capacity engineering team uh, does load tests on individual services to determine how much traffic they can handle. And they're beginning to use Hodor, uh, Hodor detectors uh, as a signal to know when to stop their tests. Uh, during these tests, the, the load shutters are actually disabled, uh, and that's because we don't want to unnecessarily impact members, and we are, are the capacity engineering is actually in, in control of these traffic ramps, so they can easily monitor the, uh, the overload signals, and as soon as anything fires, ramp things back down again. Uh, 
Auto scaling seems like it's a natural fit for this, right? Um, if uh, a majority of your cluster is indicating that it's overloaded, just add more instances. Well, it's not as easy as it seems um, because of cascading overload effects. Uh, so in some cases, adding more capacity uh, to a service at a certain level, if the overload exists at a lower level, is just going to basically give you more bandwidth to put more stress on your downstream systems. So that makes it uh, a lot worse for them. Uh, so we need to be more intelligent about how we selectively scale things. This is a problem that we're, we're currently working on. And finally, we are looking to add support for Hodor to our lower level stateful uh, and data systems. Uh, they have much different runtime characteristics and latency requirements compared to uh, the systems that we've onboarded Hodor to, which are largely stateless. And a lot of these are also built on top of Netty, which is one of the motivators for the Netty based detector that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that's it. Thank you for coming today. I hope you learned something and uh, found this interesting. I uh, also want to thank and give a lot of credit to the rest of the uh, incredibly talented uh, and hardworking engineering staff at, at LinkedIn uh, that made this project possible and a success. Okay, so the question is how hard is it for engineers to integrate it into their services and operate it day to day? Um, it's very simple. This, is, this exists at the framework level. So our team built this and deployed it with, with no interaction from uh, any of the application teams other than like, here we are enabling this for you. Uh, they, uh, individual application teams do need to track the metrics that this is publishing. So you know, setting alerts on if tra traffic is being shed, but for the most part, it works out of the box. They don't have to do anything. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, are there cases where the agent hasn't been able to do its job because of system overload? Um, since, it, since everything is running within the JVM, if you know, something kills the JVM or it gets so wedged that it just can't handle things, um, that's, that's possible. We, we haven't seen this. Some of these sort of outlier cases that we've seen are where there's something that backs up the system so bad or damages it so bad that even if we shed 100% of traffic, it's still overloaded. So we're rejecting everything and it, it still hasn't recovered. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the worst scenario that we've seen. Yeah. So yeah, it, it sounds like the question is, uh, if, if different types of requests uh, are more expensive than others, do we have ways of dealing with that? Uh, Hodor doesn't handle this. We do have support for that in uh, an in-house um, um, quota-based system that we have. So it's, it's possible for an application to uh, size you know, a request, uh, and, and then like, if you're over your quota, then it gets shed. So it's a little different. Yep. Great question. Uh, so the reason is because uh, back pressure cascades. So if you have a service that is calling out to a number of different downstreams, some endpoints might call a, a downstream that's overloaded, others might not. And so if, uh, if some amount of traffic is being affected by that back pressure but others aren't, you shouldn't shed all traffic, right? So there are pathways through the application which are going to be operating just fine. The, the overall latency is increased, but the service itself isn't overloaded, right? And so just monitoring latency isn't enough for us. Uh, we also, we don't want to be sort of the gatekeepers of latency. Uh, we expect clients to set good timeouts on that. Sure. Uh, the over, so the question was, uh, if we are running something every 10 or 13 milliseconds, isn't that going to overload the system? And what is the overhead? So the answer is that the overhead is not measurable. Uh, we are, we're sleeping. And then when we wake up, all that we're doing is putting uh, you know, some data into a queue or something like that. And then we will periodically do processing of that queue. But the, you know, it, it's effectively sleeping, doing like a couple of nanoseconds worth of work, and then going back to sleep. So the overhead for that's not measurable in our tests. So we, we, what we do is we take a timestamp, say sleep, wake up. Whenever it wakes up, take another timestamp, 
calculate the difference, put that into a queue, and that's it. So very lightweight. So the question is, does this coexist with circuit breakers? The answer is yes. Uh, this, uh, this uh, Hodor is a, a sort of server-centric and very selfish uh, way of protecting the service. Like, we don't care about the clients at the point where we, you know, if we've determined that we're in overload, things are really bad. And so um, clients still need their own protection upstream. Yep. Yeah, I, I didn't really cover that. So the question was, how do you know when to stop shedding traffic? Um, so what we, what we do, I, I guess I touched on it very briefly, what we do is that uh, once we've determined what the equilibrium point is, we will uh, start probing by allowing more traffic into the system, and then if we go back into overload, we revert back to where we were and then have an exponential back off on that. And then once uh, we find that we can allow more, back, uh, more traffic back into the system, uh, we just bump that up incrementally until uh, it's just removed entirely and the system's operating normally. Not, not constantly, but yeah, over, uh, I forget what our window sizes are, probably like 30 seconds. Uh, how much time do we give to the JVM to recover before changing the threshold? Which, which threshold do you mean? So w once we've decided that shedding traffic is necessary, it's continually shedding traffic until, uh, as, as I mentioned before, we, we start probing to see if we can uh, accept more without re-entering overload. And those windows are configurable. I think the default is we'll like sit at the current state for about 30 seconds and then um, probe. And then um, if you know, we re-enter overload, we do 60 seconds. And I, I forget the, the details of, of, it's not exponential back off, but there's definitely a back off there. So the question, I think, is does load shedding create back pressure for upstreams? <laughs> Sorry, there's, the, the applause is sort of drowning you out. Um, I, I don't know that I totally get your question, so I might need to talk to you right after. Uh, but it, it, so if, if the question is if uh, load shedding causes upstream back pressure, the, the, the answer is no. It might cause upstream cascading failures for that individual request where uh, you're returning a 503, the client's not able to retry it, and so it doesn't handle that uh, state well and then propagates the error back up the, the chain. But if that, sorry, if that wasn't your question, then yeah, let's talk. How do we shed based on priority? So we maintain uh, histograms tracking the different distributions of the different tiers. And, and so, uh, as I said, there's a concurrency limit that's backing all of this. And uh, based on the incoming rate, we calculate how much needs to be shed. And then we look at those histograms to see, uh, you know, within the recent uh, requests, how, you know, what, what level within each tier we need to uh, start dropping. Each histogram is actually broken down into 100 individual buckets so that we can segment things and we can index into those. And so we'll say we need to drop, uh, you know, uh, degradable traffic at level 68 and below. And then everything that's not at that level or below just gets dropped. Okay, I'm, I'm being told that we're running out of time or out of time. So thanks again for coming. Um,